Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Roaring Riot uh, Forum. And this is a conversation about race in sports and in fandom. And we are so happy to have you all joining us. This is the first in a series of events to help continue the conversation about race in our community. I am your moderator for today's event. Tiffany Blackman. I'm a host and reporter for Charlotte MLS. I also spent the previous five seasons covering the Southeast for NFL Network. And today I am joined by a wonderful panel with Bob Rasco, JJ Hardy, Sheena Quick, Rob Dawkins, and that is everyone that I just named. So guys, I want to also give you a second to just to say hello and then um, give everyone a chance to either get to know you or you know, find out why they know you and share who you work for as well. Guys, can you hear me? JJ, do you want to start? I'll start. Um, okay. My name is Jesse JJ Hardy. Um, I'm the creator of Panthers Culture, um, a fan brand, um, pretty much started through Twitter, um, source of alternative, alternative source of uh, Panthers news and um, and ultimately trying to celebrate the diversity within the fan base. Sheena, let's kick it to you. Guys, I'm Sheena Quick, and I am a multimedia journalist for, and I cover the Panthers for Fox Sports 1340. I cover other sports, including NASCAR, um, NCAA, uh, Big Three, for my own website, Quick Out the Blocks. And how about you, Bob? Hey, I'm Bob Rasco. Um, I'm in Virginia. Um, I tweet about Panther stuff, just like JJ Hardy. I'm hoping to bring the culture together and the organization together through fans. But more importantly, in my area, I am trying to do my best to combat racial injustice um, and partnering with multiple police departments and trying to get this thing underway. And last but not least, Rob. My name is Robert Dawkins. I'm the political director for Action NC, and I chair the statewide effort uh, called Safe Coalition that works on criminal justice reform. And I'm a big time Panther fan. You know me as Panther Rob there. And I'm on the Mint City Collective uh, Board for MLS. Thank you, everyone. And we are streaming live on YouTube and on Facebook. We'll also be taking your questions there uh, throughout this conversation. I also want to let you know, too, that we're raising money for 22 and 54 together. You guys may know those numbers. Christian McCaffrey and Shaq Thompson, they are teaming up to use sports as a vehicle, as a way to unite the community. And they are working with the Boys and Girls Club of Charlotte. They're also working with the CMPD um, as well, doing uh, they're playing flag, foot flag football as well as cheerleading. Um, so a great effort that they're putting forth in our community. We want to support that. And I also want to let you know that Roar and Riot will be matching all donations up to $1,000 to encourage you guys uh, to donate. So please do that. You can do it through the link on Facebook or through YouTube um, as well. And guys, um, I think we have a lot to dive into um, given what's been going on in our country and the fight um, against social injustice and racism. Just wanna get your thoughts. We can start, start with you, Rob, on, on just your feelings and about everything that you've been seeing going on. So what I see now, I've never experienced in my life. So I had a conversation with my dad that was around during the 60s. And he said that years of work always culminate with a major time of change. He compared this to being 1968 after uh, a lot of things were won, like the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65. Uh, there was a turning point to where it was a movement now larger than just being uh, uh, condensed to a black movement. It was a black and white movement calling for change. And I think that's the C that we're seeing right now, this major push as far as at least police accountability for people understanding now what Black Lives Matter means and for people saying enough is enough and we've got to change the systemic system that we live in. I feel the same way as you, Robin. Um, just from a personal standpoint, you know, I felt like at the beginning of all this, after George Floyd was murdered, it was overwhelming. Um, I had a lot of friends reaching out, asking me my thoughts, or I even had someone uh, reach out and apologize for something they said 10 years ago um, that I didn't even know what had happened. But I kind of shut down that week because I'm black. <laughs> I have a black father, I have a black brother, 
And those emotions of just thinking about the times that, you know, my brother's been pulled over for no reason at all. Um, it was kind of a, an emotional, I guess, an emotional kind of roller coaster. You're angry, you're, you're sad, uh, you're frustrated. Um, but like Robert mentioned, maybe this time does feel different. So you're also hopeful as well. But um, certainly this is kind of a unique experience that we're all going through together. Sheena, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, it's been a little bit difficult for me. Of course, I remember a couple years back with the Mike Brown incident, but the years have passed and I have three boys. So I have one teenager that's knocking on the door of high school in a couple of months. I have my middle son is right behind him a year later. And of course, Aiden is the little whippersnapper at four. But um, it's been difficult. It's been difficult trying to put myself in in the shoes of a young black man, which is who I'm raising here. But um, my experience has been different. I haven't, I've never been pulled over. I don't have any really, you know, direct racial incidences that I, incidents that I can, you know, pull from. So this is kind of uncharted territory for, for me. You know, um, number one, my kids are very active. We usually have a very active schedule, whether it's with sports or school, which of course, coronavirus has like screeched that to a halt. And then on top of that, you have the racial climate. So kids that are usually able to, you know, express themselves and have friends and, and be recreational, right now they're in their, they're stuck in a the house. They're on their phones. They're on they're watching TV. And um, it's brought about a lot of anxiety in my oldest son. It was really hard because I've I've not seen my son cry since he was maybe four. And it really was heartbreaking to to realize that at 14, he's taller. Of course, he's still my baby. His voice is deep. And it scares me to think about the fact that I have to relinquish control to young black men in a society that has basically treated them as disposable. So for me, it's, it's a challenge every day, but it's, it's, it's a different perspective for me just because like I said I haven't I've had I haven't gone through that I haven't been racially profiled to my knowledge I haven't been pulled over for no reason and I sca I'm scared to think about that possibly happening to my baby because no one has ever pinpointed the age where a young black boy goes from being a young handsome cute black boy to being a threat just walking down the street of your own neighborhood but for somebody that doesn't think that you belong there so it's been a struggle for me. I'm going to try not to cry on these progress. I've cried before. No, you're <laughs> right. I can see cry, but you're about to make me, me choke up because it's like, terrifying why? because like, what do you say? How do you calm those fears when you don't know if it's going to be okay? So that's been my experience. Just kind of trying to make sure they unplug a little bit. I mean, I think it's good for them to be aware, but I don't like them living in fear and not being able to be children. It's, that's, that's really hard. And we're hoping through this conversation that maybe we can help facilitate ways to start to start changing that. Um, yeah. You know, like uh, you know, like Sheena, I haven't really experienced anything directly, but I do have thoughts of, you know, when I'm walking through certain neighborhoods, I'm actually glad I have my dog with me because maybe I look like less of a threat. <laughs> You're less likely to do something bad. They're like, oh, she's really actually dogging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So those thoughts have gone through my head, but um, I have not put myself in the shoes or, or I can put myself in the shoes, but I obviously am not a black man, but I know, you know, Rob um, already spoke with us and, 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 you know, JJ, I'm sure you and Bob have a lot to talk to um, in terms of your experience. Um, I can go and, you know, I'm sitting here listening to um, Sheena and, you know, talking about her sons, you know, and my, my family, you know, we have sons, we have nephews, you know, we have um, little cousins, we have, friends who have sons and, you know, but not only sons, daughters, you know, who are going out in society every day and, you know, we feel challenged, you know, by letting them go out there and, and confront, you know, all that, you know, that they have to encounter every day anyway, but also having to battle with the challenge of being Black. Um, listening, I was thinking of, you know, different things that's happened in my life, so I'll just pick one, you know, where um, I have an experience here in Atlanta. I was traveling through Buckhead with my family back in 2015. And um, late afternoon, sun is setting. And there's a glare, you know, on the on the right side of my car. 
and I'm looking over there and I see a police car pointed out into the street and I'm trying to figure out why they're pointing into the street. And as I get closer to the car, the glare kind of goes away and I'm looking to the car and there are two police officers looking back at me. And um, it's Buckhead, if you know Atlanta, traffic is slow, I'm headed towards Atlanta's Mall. And as soon as I pass by the police car, the police pull it out behind me. And traffic is so slow that I'm barely moving. And probably, I don't know, a tenth of a mile, a tenth of a mile down the road, you know, the, the lights come on and I hear the sound, whoop, whoop. And so I look at my wife and ask her, like, you know, you think you think these people are gonna stop us, you know, for looking at them? And so I was like, nah, that can't be the case. So let's just get out of their way so they can get to where they're trying to go to. So we pulled over into a shopping center of sorts to try to get out of the way, but they followed me in. And um, you know, the craziest thing happened after that. They they both get out of the car. I guess that's protocol. One comes to my window and the other goes around to my to my wife's window, the passenger side, you know, with his hand on his on his weapon. I can see all this in the mirrors. And then he comes and asks me for my license and registration. So uh, my my wife goes into the um, the glove box to get the registration. I go to the cup holder where my wallet was just so I could pull my license out. And you know, I'm trying to stay calm and, and do everything I need to do. And I finally get everything and hand it to the officer. But as I'm handing it to him, I, I'm asking him, what did I do for you to pull me over? Because there was no infraction. We can't do anything. We can drive fast and can do anything. And, and he looked at me straight in the eyes and, and said, because you were felt you know, because of failure to wear your seatbelt. And I had my seatbelt on. And I was shocked. And he stepped off as he said that. My wife is going crazy next to me, um, saying that, you know, one thing he's not going to do is lie on us and, you know, yada, yada, yada. I'm trying to keep her calm. And I was like, look, we'll sort it out when he comes back to the car. So he comes back to the car. He hands me a ticket, says it's for $100, and, um, and told me, you know, that basically, you know, it's because I didn't have a seatbelt on. Again, I'm wearing my seatbelt. And I said, hey, officer, I don't know what happened. I don't know if you thought that I was staring at you, you know, back down the street and, you know, you felt the need to come and address it. I don't know why you're telling this, you know, this, this tale about me not wearing a seatbelt because obviously I had one on. And before I can get all that out, my wife starts talking over me and saying, what you're not going to do is lie on us and say that, you know, my, my husband was doing something that he wasn't doing. And, um, and he, you know, his whole demeanor changed. And he yelled back at her, um, are you challenging me? Are you challenging my words? Are you challenging my authority? Are you trying to challenge me? And in a moment, I just kind of took a deep breath. I looked at him and I saw the anger in his face. I wanted to snap back at him. And then I looked at my wife, I said, be quiet. Just shut up. Don't say another word to this man. And he still leaned over in my, in my window and I said, just, just be quiet, don't say another word. My children in the back seat, shaking. Um, I'm shaking. He walks off. Well, I don't know, before he walks off, let me get it right. Before he walks off, I said, I, again, we're just trying to figure out why you stopped me. Obviously, I have my seatbelt on. And he says to me as he's walking off, you know, you can take it up in court. And I just said nothing else. And um, as they retreated to their car, I stayed there for a minute, waiting for them to leave. And I just told her, I said, look, I just want to go home. And I remember going home, um, shaking, kind of emasculated a little bit because I felt like I was in a situation where I had no choice but to cower down or potentially get pulled out of the car and you know, God knows what next. And I remember going to Facebook and writing you know, the event um, I posted, you know, that on Facebook so people could know what had just happened with me. And um, I felt a little embarrassed because I felt at the time, you know, that I'm a professional black man. Um, I was on, out on a Saturday with my family, had gone to get some burgers. I was going to Georgetown Cupcakes to get some cupcakes for my wife. That's that's why I was down in, in Buckhead. Panthers fans. And um, did, did we get interrupted? You're good. So stay with us. We're We're good. Okay, and so um, and I'll cut it short from here. That experience um, is an experience that, that changed me. And so that was 2015 and 2016. Um, it was Alton Sterling, it was Philando Castile, 
we had had Mike Brown. Um, and for some reason, after that, I connected to every encounter with the cops, you know, in the, for, for black men. And I've been empathetic to everything since that point because I knew that just one false movement from me would have led to a different outcome. And um, thank God it didn't happen, but um, definitely I'm engaged in everything that, ha that I've seen happen from that point forward. And that's when the conversation comes up about how maybe certain groups of people, and if we're being you know, straightforward, if we're talking about white people, maybe have you had to have conversations with your son about what to do when he gets pulled over? I know my brother who's 6'4", over 200 pounds. Um, he was pulled over by a female cop that was like 5'5". Five, five. The story reminds me of just a, of, of yours, JJ, um, because his taillight was out and he was going to my parents' house. And he pulls up to my parents' house, tells them what happened, the taillight's not out. Um, and so you just think about moments like that where, you know, what if he had did the wrong thing? What if he argued? You know, what if you had did the wrong thing, JJ? And, you know, something's happening in front of your kids. Um, we, I do have a question coming in, but um, I do want to get to you, Bob, just to get your experience before I address that question and, and keep them coming. Um, this is an open forum. We want to answer your questions and get you involved because this is an open conversation that needs to be had. Sure. I appreciate you, Tiff. Um, I mean, I, I'm raising a son who's 15, he's six foot three, wears a size 14 shoe. And I'm, wearing a, I'm raising a beautiful daughter who's eight, who thinks she's 28. Um, and, and this is the life that um, I find myself repeating some of the same things that my grandparents and, and my mother told me, right? You know, take your hoodie off when you're walking outside. You know, make sure that, you know, if you're, if you're going to the store, you don't go by yourself just in case things happen. Um, and my grandmother spoke with my daughter the other day. We were at my mom's house. And uh, my grandmother spoke with my daughter. And my grandmother was explaining how things were when she was coming up and, and the level of protection just to walk to school um, that they needed from one another. Um, the, level, the level of hate that they received just trying to go to schools with Caucasians. And the, some of the same things she was saying, my daughter spoke and she said, that sounds like what we're dealing with right now. Um, and it like really was heartbreaking to my grandmother to know that everything she fought for, you know, the riots she experienced, um, the, the lynchings that she saw in her own neighborhood from friends and family members, nothing has changed. Right. The only difference is now we're seeing it more recorded and, and pushed on social media. Um, you know, when I was 16, um, I had my mom's Lexus. Right. I was a 16 year old driving my mom's brand new Lexus. And we were on. Um, I live right near Virginia Beach. Um, and it's a section called the Strip. That's where everybody walks, drives. And like, if you want to be cool, you're going to drive on the Strip like five miles an hour. And um, that's what we were doing. And um, with no disrespect to the Caucasian community, but. You know, these white guys were hanging out multiple Jeeps, like just hanging out, clearly drunk times unless you participate in something. Uh, for us, it was me and the homies, right? You know, it's four of us and my mom's new car, and we're driving. Um, probably speed max was 10 miles per hour. Miles per hour. Um, at the time, they were on horses. The Virginia Beach police officers were on horses. Um, we were at a stoplight, they walked up beside us, stopped us, asked me for license and registration, told me immediately, well, asked me immediately, is this car stolen or is it yours? I laughed, told him it was my mom's vehicle, she just got it, she was letting me use it for the weekend. Um, long story short, again, I'm 16, he sees that my mother's last name is different from my I do the marriage, so automatically he's saying this last name doesn't match what's on your license. I told him, I said, I can call my mom right now, whatever you need me to do. He progressed, he handed, he handed me back the license of registration, talked to his fellow officer, they both got off of the horse, put a horse in front of the car, put a horse in the back of the car. Came on one side, one officer that would speak, his, I uh, wanna say radio went off, and probably there was a fight about 30 seconds from where we were. So at that point, he told me, get off the strip, and he left. So I don't know what could happen. Right. I'm not saying that they would have pulled, pulled us out of the car and beat us or shot us. But I am saying that um, these things that are happening today are not new. Right. It's, it's nothing that we haven't seen before. We've been seeing these things for decades. The only difference is, again, now it's being recorded. So the things that were happening to us is, as kids from our teachers, as teenagers from law enforcement, now as adults um, that we're dealing with, is not new. Right. We're just now finding the courage to stand up to it and say there's something that needs to be done. Yeah, and we're also in a pandemic right now, so everyone kind of has no choice. You can't really look away right now because hopefully you're all at home, right? Um, I do want to mention too, if you're 
obviously you're probably not watching us on YouTube because we are having some trouble. Um, and forgive me, I'm using this on my phone, so I'm reading these text messages off my watch. Um, but we're having some trouble streaming on YouTube, so we'll post that video of our discussion on there when it's over. Um, as far as the questions go, and please keep them coming in. We have one from Anna. Um, she says, I've started discussions with my daughter who's 12. What are some things as a white parent I may be missing in these talks I'm having with her? Um, who wants to start with that one? Is that you, Rob? I will. You know, letting your daughter know that it's systemic, that it's not just that we're talking about the police, but that we're talking about every uh, facet that we live in. So whether it's school and how if you are young and you are black and you do the smallest infraction that leads to suspension or whether it's the healthcare industry and African Americans are denied access to care that would normally not be denied. And you know, it's larger than the police, but you see it more from the police because they're the people that are in charge of enforcing laws that were made systemically and enforced to treat African Americans different. And the last thing I will say is even though uh, Tiffany and um, Sheena were blessed not to have these experiences, they are rougher experiences maybe for African American men, but women see it too, just in a different structure. Women see it as my wife who works for the bank, got a master's in IT, will still be followed in a store because black women being at South Park Mall in their mind are boosters and they're out to try to steal something for them. Or in an employment situation, if my wife wants to raise her hand at a meeting and have a comment, she's the angry black woman, whether she's angry or not. So it's perpetrated more on the male side, but it's, it's also perpetrated on the female side. And the last part that I always that I wanna say is, when you talk about what Sheena, what you talk about with Tiffany, and what you talk about what Bobby said, it really gets perpetrated among a young black man because what will happen is a police officer sees a six foot tall uh, African American 14 year old as a grown man, you know, and they treat them differently. And these are the things that we have to work on people getting rid of their biases because it keeps perpetrating into African Americans being treated differently, mainly because we had no say when these laws were being made. No, I definitely agree, Rob. Um, if I can piggyback real quick, I um, hope y'all don't mind. Um, no, jump in, that's what I want you to do. <laughs> I appreciate it. So what Anna was asking, um, in reference to her daughter, I think something that's very important is my daughter's eight and she's come home on numerous occasions asking if I thought she was treated differently based upon her skin, right? I mean, literally just asking questions. Do you think it could, could have been because I was black? Some things, no, right? I'll tell her straight, no, that's not why. Some things, yes. Um, and what I can tell Anna is just to re remind your daughter, like if she has black friends, like continue to be that friend through all of this, right? Don't shy away from it. Um, she's gonna have friends, other white friends that are confused as to why you have an African-American friend. Just remind her, if she's a friend to that African-American friend, continue to be a friend. Because what happens is her turning her back on her African-American friend because of other Caucasian friends, that lasts for a lifetime, right? Like my daughter will never forget that Anna's daughter stopped talking to her because of her other friends or because she looked different or because she was black. She never forgets that. That's mentally damaging. It's a form of abuse, um, unintentional abuse, right? And so that carries with her for the rest of her life. You know, every white friend that she meets moving forward, she's gonna question, right? So relationships and friendships are always gonna be burdened with what she went through. So if I could tell you one thing to tell your daughter, just continue to be a friend through it all. Like, that's the best thing. And we know everybody on this panel right now understands that white people have family members that they're losing right now and friends that they're losing right now due to standing with us, right? And we wanna help you understand that we do appreciate that. Like, we're not taking it for granted. We understand that you are losing decades of relationships and family members due to standing with us. We appreciate it and we understand your pain. We just ask that you continue to stand with us through it all because if you don't, we can't do it alone. We need you to partner with us and that starts with the children.
And also for you, Anna, um, coming off of, of what Bob just said, um, a lot of what, times what happens too is like you're a product of your environment, right? So if you're in a school where there's not any black kids or a lot of black kids, you don't know. This also will gradually move up into the workplace and what you see with people hiring people that look like them. Um, so I would maybe encourage your daughter um, or to diversify or maybe there's, you know, other, so she's 12, but there's still children's books, different shows, maybe different dolls to play with just so she knows there are people out there that don't look like her. Um, right. It sounds so simple, but I think it makes, it's, makes such a difference, especially when you're talking about kids, because as Bob said, at eight, I mean, your daughter already knows color, and I'm sure, Anna, maybe your daughter already knows color at 12. Um, when, they're far, when they're much littler than that, um, they don't have a concept of that. So it's something that they're taught, but it's something that they need to know so they can grasp what's going on right now. Um, I do want to keep us moving, because I know we went kind of heavy on, um, on the front end, but um, maybe we can dive down now into just what's been going on um, in Charlotte with the protests happening here um, from what you all have been seeing, what your perspective on, on what's been going on um, here. And we can, uh, I guess, kick it back to Sheena. We haven't heard from you in a little bit. <laughs> well, I think it's, um, it's interesting because Charlotte, you know, we're close to Concord and um, we got the news that NASCAR is banning the Confederate flag and like, maybe. Yeah a day later maybe i don't even know if it was the same day we see the statue of jerry richardson taken down from bank of america stadium so charlotte is a large metropolitan city like i'm not shocked that there were protests here um i did see that the black lives matter i don't know if that was defaced purposely or it was just somebody that was driving by but at the end of the day like us, like you and I, we haven't particularly had direct issues with racism. We don't know what people have said behind our back, but I know for me, I found out a lot about classmates during this time that people that I had gone to school with from like kindergarten all the way, even going to the same college. And um, that's been interesting. Like in addition to people losing family members, as far as white people that are trying to, uh, to align, align themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement, you're seeing people who you always thought were good people. You would have never thought they were racist, but like Rob said earlier, it's systemic. It's something that to them, it might not be racist because that's how they've, all, that's how they've been taught and they've always learned those things. And it might not be saying the N word or, or being outright blatantly racist, but it's a racism thought process that has affected a lot of people that I grew up with. That was honestly very shocking that I had to basically cut ties with on Facebook. I'm like, dang, I never knew you even thought that. Like, that's disgusting, that's despicable. But you find people that even if they did have black friends, they're like, well, yeah, but that's you. I feel like this about black people, but I don't feel like that about you. I know you personally. So I'll ask you, Tiffany, I know you're moderating, but have you had any of those experiences where there are people that you would, if someone asked you if you knew a racist, they would be the furthest person from your mind. Have you um, had that experience? I can, t what you just said kind of struck a nerve because I've had people say, oh, well, you're not black, black. Like you get that, right? Uh, is it because of how I talk? My, my eyes are shaped a little smaller. Um, it's a lot of different things, but it's offensive, right? So what do right. you associate with being black, black? Do you have this preconceived image of like, what maybe you see in rap videos, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's so, um, it's, it, I, I'm not finding the right words to explain it, but it's People almost are subconsciously like, racist. This is yeah, subconscious yes, racism. It's, ra it's racist. Um, yeah. It's flat out racist, but it's like, you can, you can only accept, like, you know me and my family, but you're not accepting like my full blackness. Like I'm black, exactly. my family's black. Um, but because I go to your school, and I played soccer growing up or did other activities where I, you know, I, I went to predominantly white schools given the areas that I grew up in. Um, so I did, I, you know, I did come to realize that or in circumstances where um, I went to North Point High School um, in Suwannee in Georgia. And we had one of our prominent football players um, whose brother played in the NFL. He didn't make it there. And he was a poster child for our school. When he graduated, there was like a full page thing in the AJC um, just about how great this kid was, because he was great. And he had wanted to take one of my good friends to uh, homecoming. And I would spend the night with this person all the time. Our families knew each other. And her parents said no. And it was because he was black. black. They also wanted to make sure that I didn't know that. 
because she told me. Um, that also happened with another really good friend that wanted to go to prom with one of the black guys at our school, I'm trying to make sure I'm not saying names. Um, and he was great, Fan fantastic human being, but she wasn't allowed to go with him because he was black and it was, but don't let Tiffany know about. Um, so it just, I hope I explained that well enough. But, you did. I mean, um, it's, it's so many layers to it. We've experienced it too. It. Like, I know we'll get to it later. I know we're going, I'm getting to, I know we are going heavy on these first, few, first couple topics, but um, for more, more so from Sheena and from, from my perspective too, because of, and I'm sure people may be aware of what happened with you on the internet, on Twitter yesterday. Um, but yeah, we've experienced it for sure when it comes to the workplace. That's another can of worms that, um, that we will hopefully get to. Um, and I know we didn't jump to everybody in this, but um, we can keep hopping it around and I can move on to the, uh, the next topic here with, um, when we're looking at the Panthers, the old regime versus the new regime and how they've handled social injustice issues, right? So in 2016, and I was here for that, where we had Keith Scott versus now in 2020 with George Flo Floyd, excuse me, um, and JJ, maybe I'll kick it to you. Um, you know, what have you seen then? What is your perspective on how things have been handled you know, now in 2020? Um, well, first and foremost, I do think um, that there's a big shift from, you know, who the Panthers used to be under Jerry Richardson and who they are under Dave Tepper. Uh, obviously, Tepper came into the door expressing how he was more of a progressive style owner. Um, one of the first things that showed me that was when he um, acquired Eric Reed back in 2018 um, that let me know he wasn't one of the good old boys and he was going to do things different. Um, you know, we can see the difference in, you know, players like Trey Boston. I think Trey Boston came out recently in an interview and expressed how different the experience has been under this regime and how supported um, he has been and other players has been, you know, and speaking out and being active um, regarding the social injustices of compared to when he was with the team before under Jerry Richardson's um, ownership and how that Panthers regime prevented them from being able to speak out, wanted to control the narrative, um, and they never got the opportunity to do that. And so uh, I think Dave Tepper is the best owner we can have for this moment in time um, based on what's going on. I see Trey Boston doing what he's doing. I've seen Shaq Thompson step up big time. Um, some lesser known players like Andre Smith um, has been very active. You know, what he did with, um, with the computers, with the laptops, 600 laptops, you know, um, you know to, their, to their chosen charity, showed me that, you know, the Panthers are really trying to get behind this. I know it's a full regime change. Matt Rule has come out and said certain things that he would be supportive of the players. Um, it's just good to see, and, um, and I'm glad that we, that we have the ownership that would back the players now, you know, versus – know the type of ownership we had before. I know I've been talking a lot, Tiffany. I just wanted to pop in really no, quick. No, no, no. Feel free to jump. I want everyone to jump in. I don't need to tee anybody up. <laughs> just to kind of back, to piggyback off of that, um, David Tepper is a man of the people. Yeah. He, You've heard several players talk about how, you know, personable he is, how approachable he is. He calls them. While you have people that were on this team that did not have a speaking relationship with Jerry Richardson. And so that also ties into it, like Tepper's more aware of what's going on in the community that the Panthers are a part of. So I think that it offers an, another layer of humanity and understanding, not to mention he, you know, he earned his billions. So he's not like a trust fund baby or anything like that, you know? So a lot of those concepts that, you know, we do see present in Southern white men, older Southern white men, you don't see those in David Tepper. Like, I've never felt like I've, I've gotten on the elevator with Tepper several times. I never felt like I couldn't speak. Like he talked, he, he treated me as an equal. And when it comes to Jerry Richardson, it was just like, oh, there's Jerry Richardson. He's not going to talk to us. That, that's the owner. He's over there. He's going to ride in his golf cart. David Tepper, he's kissing babies, smiling, waving, joking around with you. So I think that has a lot to do with it too, because he can relate to the players and he's making an effort to actually relate to the players. It's not lost on him that football is, is a predominantly black, Sport when it comes to players so how can you own this team and care about this team and not care about the plight of your players once they step off the football field so that's what that's my little two cents I wanted to pop in there and say I think that's the difference I've noticed personally between Jerry Richardson and David Tepper I definitely agree um 
one of the things that um before I say this, please, y'all, don't send me any dumb messages on Twitter. This ain't got nothing to do with the Panthers on the field. This is off the field, okay? I just got to start that off because y'all know how they do on my mentions. But anyway, um, I support Dave Tepper 1,000%. Um, I see a huge difference in, like Sheena and JJ said, and how players are responding to this regime based upon comfort, right? We're not talking about winning games on the field. We're talking about personal and business comfort. Okay, um, I always go back to Richardson in the interview speaking about Cam Newton in reference to he didn't want Cam to grow his hair. Um, he didn't want Cam to get tattoos. And it really gives a it really gives a whole different meaning to owner. Right. Because when you're telling me what I can look like as a grown man, you're dictating what I can look like to play for your franchise. It's almost slave owner like. Right. You need to look a certain way to work for me. And that's what I got from that. But with Tepper, even though people are going to always bring up the Tepper and Cam split, whatever they want to call it, his support for the African-American athlete outside of Camden speaks volumes. The fact that he said he's willing to kneel. Right. He's willing to kneel with his team. That speaks volumes. It's something that, uh, um, you know, Tepper, I'm sure he would, too. But something that Richardson would have never even made himself available to the media to even speak about this. He probably would have had PR issue a statement in reference to it, but he would have been silent. Um, and I think what we're getting now from Tepper and Rule is something that the city of Charlotte needs, not just the team, but the city of Charlotte needs desperately. Can I add in something real quick? Or we... Oh, yeah, I, want, I was waiting on you. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the two different sides. I'm a big supporter of David Tepper. I believe that David Tepper is bringing me to change. I'm also going to say that there are some things that I see that also need to be addressed. First of all, I think that being from Spartanburg, I'm not going to be biased because I'm from Spartanburg from Temper. Temper did, uh, uh, Richardson did some bad things. He made some racist comments. He's done that. And he never apologized. At the same time, I can say, even though he put those different restraints on Cam, which I wasn't happy for, under Richardson, I knew Cam was my quarterback. I knew Cam was going to be able to play wherever he wanted to play, how he wanted to play, and he could succeed. And that right there gave me a little bit of hope that even people that grew up Southern, that grew up under his regime, had some hope. So I will give, I will give Richardson that. I'll also give Tepper his credit where it's due, and he does. We'll nail, we'll be more uh, uh, open, but at the same time, I'm never going to forget the Cam Newton situation. That's not going to go out of my way, no matter how many times that he kneels. I'm never going to be totally satisfied without an answer to why our second uh, best tackler on the team is gone. I don't know why Tory Smith is gone, and we picked up other people that didn't have the productivity of, of, of Tory Smith. So I see where Richardson failed, and I can say there was problems, but I can say also even though Tepper kisses babies and he goes with people, what happened to Cam? What happened to Eric Reed? Why isn't Tory Smith on the team? And those are some things that me, and I'm going to always be a Panther fan, will say I'm not ready to give him an A-plus for either. I understand that. I mean, they, they were the most vocal. And Tiffany, I can throw this, the same question you're throwing to us right back at you. Like, what are you seeing differently? Um, because you, you do see a huge difference between the two regimes. But like Rob said, we also see a difference of the most vocal leaders being sent packing in a sense. Well, I think you can, if I can, I think you can broaden it actually with what we're seeing um, going around in the NFL, which still isn't perfect and still has a lot of work to do. But you had brought up with um, RB Machina, excuse me, but Trey, Trey Boston, right? Like being able to, to speak out um, and share his thoughts and be active in the community. Shaq taking that big step as, as we've seen. Um, I think what we're witnessing now with, players actually kind of forcing the hand with, you know, Goodell having to get on um, and um, I'm going to mess it up, but, um, you know, get on to video after the players did there. Here's what we would like the NFL to say, which was so powerful. And they were able to team up with um, the social media folks um, from the league. And so you saw them actually use their voice, use their power. And that's honestly, as someone that covered the league for as long as I did, um, that's what I was waiting to see. I'm like, I don't think people realize how much power the players have because there's no game without you guys. Uh, that's the same thing we saw with the young man at Mississippi, in Mississippi State. Um, 
I mean, how powerful is that? Vowing to not play. He's not going to play there if the, if the flag, you know, if that doesn't change. Um, I think that's what we, that's what needed to happen. Um, and I'm so glad that it's happening now that people are using their platforms, using their voice and leveraging their power because I mean, the league is, is predominantly black. Um, and we could probably dive into the whole coaching ranks thing too, because I have a lot to weigh in on that, but I know that's not part of the conversation right now. I did get another text. So let me just check on that. Um, Let's see, we do have another question, actually. And I do want to remind you all, too, um, that we are doing donations. So we're raising money, um, and we're taking your donations for 22 and 54 together. That's, you know, Christian McCaffrey and Shaq Thompson teaming up together to use sports as a way to unite the community. And you can do that through the links on um, YouTube if it's up and running. And you can do that through the link on Facebook as well. Um, the question that is you, coming in right I'm sorry? Tiffany, while you were looking, I wanted to add something else that we see yeah. overall that I would still would like the Panthers to address. Anytime you are a black man and you go to a hospital, they think that we have a higher tolerance for pain. They think that, that we heal at a different rate. And I saw a lot of that in Cam Newton over the past two years. It's just a foot. It's just a shoulder. He's six foot four, 280. He can take this better than other people. We can change things around that we wouldn't do if he was a smaller quarterback. And that was under both Richardson and Tepper. And when we talk about biases, it goes back to the bias that people have against big black men or your son being six foot tall. Uh, they can take more pain. They can take more and we don't have to worry about them as much. Thank you, Rob. Um, I do, um, the question that came in actually is gonna relate to the topic that we're gonna get to after this one. So KB, if you can just hang on a second. Um, I'm gonna touch on this first um, with, with Sheena. Um, just our experiences as black women working in sports and um, Sheena, I can start with you because I know you had a lot going on yesterday um, and you faced probably a lot throughout your career like I have. Um, well, what was the specific question like as far as the workplace? Um, if you want to just, if you, I mean, I can start if you want me to, but just get, to get into your experience, like I could go forever on like hair or even having people talk about, well, you go, you go ahead if you want, <laughs> do you want me to take it? <laughs> also, I mean, the thing about it is um, the idea that there can only be one or two black people yes. or yes. black women. Um, this is my second career. My degrees are in accounting and finance. I mean, it's like. <laughs> night and day but having been an athlete sports have just always been my thing so when I did enter um into the sports journalism world you know coming in and out of the locker rooms I will say I'm not gonna name any names but um you know there was another black man that has you know has a show and so an, an older black guy he's like oh you should have Sheen on there as a guest da, 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 da. and I was just joking I was like yeah he I said oh he, he just he's, he doesn't want me on the show doesn't want me on the show and I said it's because I'm black isn't it and it was a joke but it was serious. That was the reason why, Tiffany, because he felt like his audience only wanted to see white women. And he said that. And I'm just sitting here like trying to figure out, like, is he being sarcastic? But he's doubled down on it. He, and, and he also is just like, you know, I have to be diverse and I'm already black, so I can't have a black co-host. And you so. see that in TV with like the formula, right? So there's the guys in the booth and then there's um, as we've seen mostly, and I'm not trying to make this a black white issue, no, I mean, um, even though truth. a lot of it is, but I'm just going to go with y'all. Um, that's like the formula, right? You have the guys in the booth and then typically the sideline reporter has been a white female. And we do have obviously Pam Oliver, Lisa Salters, um, and, um, and Maria Taylor, but there ain't that many of us, right? And just the right. day, to, the day to day stuff. So we look at some of the smaller college games and things like that. We're missing. Right. There's a significant, like, it's a, it's a huge gap that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, getting more into just my experience, I didn't think about, um, I, when I was growing up, almost, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really, you don't think about things. And so I knew I wanted to do TV. And all of a sudden, I'm telling my parents, okay, I'm going to do this. I got, someone finally said yes. They dropped me off in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And they're like, you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this. But never in my back of my mind did I think, well, they've never had a black female doing sports here at all. Like, and I'm driving out to the Ritter and all these places where I've got, you know, maybe a, a white officer has said to me, hey, don't come back this way because it's not safe for you to be out here. Um, that stuff that was like, whoa, wow. like, where am I? Or if I was driving to Houston from Lake Charles, 
I have people tell me, do not stop in Viner. Do not stop there because that's, mm -hmm. everyone knows about that town, right? Um, then all of a sudden my path took me to Waco, Texas. Okay, there have never been a black female sports anything out in Waco. And then all of a sudden I'm becoming sports director. Um, I went to Oklahoma City. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's like, you get okay. them all too. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I, uh, I finally, yeah, ended to be up, like... <laughs> and I finally ended up in Houston. Um, oddly enough, I never had encountered any, like, I never counted racism in any of those small towns that I was in. I didn't encounter it actually until I got to Houston, um, where I got wow. a really horrible tweet. But, um, but anyway, um, when I think what and I had a forum with a lot of young um, black females on I think it was two two weekends ago and Sheena was on that call as well and it's just like the workplace stuff so what, what you see happening is in a lot of those smaller places I was in and when I was kind of rising up faster through the ranks I would have some male colleagues white male colleagues say to my face oh well no one wants white guys anymore um oh well, you're gonna get out of here because you're a black female because now you're like the hot commodity kind of thing um, and I don't think people realize when you, like, that is, it's, it's racist. You have to work and it's, harder. And it's hurtful. You have to work harder, right? Um, I can't afford to make as many mistakes. Um, it's also about the fact that, like, I, I earned that opportunity. Like, I was shooting cam, I was shooting, I was editing, doing everything by myself. So be, be told that I'm only getting something because I'm black female, it's like, what? And then when I got to NFL Network, there hadn't been a black female anchor there since I believe Danielle Sargent. Um, and I'm walking through those hallways and, um, and I always equate this with like the black people head nod. Like when you're in the mall or somewhere and you're the only ones, you're like, oh, I see, I see it. And so that's, I was getting a ton of that there and I wasn't, I was like, man, what's going on? Like, why is, why is the secretary like giving me the head nod? What's happening here? So I didn't, I didn't really realize like, um, in those moments, just how, I, I guess, powerful what I was doing was, even though I was just doing something that I love doing, um, right. but I, I earned the right to be there. And so you see that with other, in other, like, areas and in, um, in other career paths. Um, let me check this text. It's not, it's just my watch telling me to stand up. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> once you love those, it'll be like 11 o'clock and it'll say, hey, you can meet your goal if you take a short, brisk walk <laughs> in the bed. <laughs> Just give it up. <laughs> but yeah, I think what you end up, but I was happened. in, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, in, I was in the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, and the sister walked by carrying her luggage, and I gave her that head nod, and the person said, "Oh, you, you say hey to the stewardess." I said, "No, she's the no. pilot." Did you, did you not see <laughs> wow. the hat? Did you not see the rings on her sleeve? She is a pilot, right? You know, that's the deal. Like. That's a sister with Delta, but she's a flight attendant. No, she's the pilot. Give her so, her due respect. Yeah. So like what, All right. what, Tiffany, what Tiffany and Sheena were talking about, and listen, I'm, I'm not a black woman, so I don't, you know, I haven't dealt with those unfortunate situations, but I was raised by a gang of black women. You know, I was able to see the things that they went through on the job, being qualified for certain things, having degrees for certain things. And the, you know, the, the newest time Nick and Harry walks through the door and gets the promotion, you know, and they give no response as to why. Um, yeah. I know Sheena's stories, um, backstories of, of, of being in the interview rooms and, and waiting for opportunities. It's not fun. And, and I'm sure, Tiffany, you've gone through the same things. The thing that breaks my heart the most is at one point, I felt like they're just trying to take out our, 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 our black men, right? They're trying to take us out early. But then I saw Sandra Bland. And then it made me realize, okay, it ain't just us that they're trying to take out. Right. They're really trying to take us completely out, right? Like, yeah. period. The entire yeah. race, they want us gone. And that became clear to me because as a man, if you put your hands on another man, you know, you feel some type of way. Sometimes you feel some type of remorse depending on the situation. But if you can put your hands on a woman and harm a woman, yet alone kill a woman and feel nothing about it, then that lets me know you truly feel nothing when you kill me. Because there's something special about a woman, their life, their presence, like their personality, it's just something precious about them where you want to save them more than you want to hurt them, right? And men, you might be like, if something happened to him, you'll be all right, he's a man. But 
the fact that they can do this to a woman and be okay with it, get away with it, offer no explanation, and the injustice continues to happen, not just with our black brothers. And I think that's something that we really need to understand is not just happening with black men, it's happening with our black women, it's happening with black trans uh, gender, it's happening with everybody, right? So, right. Um, and it's unfortunate that we keep talking about the men versus highlighting the women that are going through this too. Um, we have a list of men, right? For some reason, that can yeah. to Yeah, we do all the time but then we have this list of women that's just for some reason put in the closet somewhere until it's cool to make a meme or until it's cool to make a GoFundMe about something but the women are having oh, okay. it happen just as much exactly like they're having it happen just as much as the men and I really hate that for some reason the men continue to be the face of racism the black men continue to be the face of racism when the same things are happening to our women too so please like I beg you um, do not see um, black men as, as you know, black people telling me all the time, it has to be hard being a black man. It's just as hard as being, being a black woman. It's probably twice as hard, to be honest. Because as a woman, you have to prove yourself in this world. And being a black woman, that's triple, right? You know, you're a woman, you're black, and you're unproven. So you got to go out and do all of these things three times as hard as the next person. So please, I just beg y'all, stop, stop putting our faces as if we're the only victims because we're not. The women are out here suffering just as much as we are, as well as the children. To piggyback off of that, and I know this might be a very polarizing statement, but I think that Black women are the most unprotected demographic in the country. I think that we so often are looked at the, as the nurturers, the fixers, the, you know, taking the high road that, and we, we do a lot to support everybody. And we're constantly pouring from our cup and it's very rare that we get it poured back in. So like back with, with on the subject of women in the workplace, especially in, you know, Tiffany, you and I's field of sports. Um, you take a lot of stuff. And you often have to make a decision between your self-respect and your career. There are a lot of things that can happen to you that you feel the need to be silent about because like you know like you guys stated earlier who wants to be the angry black woman or who wants to be the black woman with baggage but then on the flip side i can get a scoop or a breaking story and instead of saying oh okay someone actually confides in you you do your job well you people think you're sleeping with them and when i say people i mean an editor of mine i'm like look i have this breaking story i just found it well are you having an inappropriate work relationship i'm like no you know this person in, in real life like this is somebody that lives across the country that follows my work so it's just so many different aspects of being a black woman in now I'm, I'm not going to say just in sports i'm just speaking on my of my personal experience where you take more more jabs than others you know it's difficult to get a foot in the door and as i'm i'm pretty sure you know the elephant in the room is what has happened on twitter over the last couple of days as women have, you know, myself included, divulged their, their issues with sexual harassment when it comes to a certain website. But being that you're black, you're a woman, unproven, you're trying to get your foot in the door, this is someone that has a huge platform. He'll get your credential, but you have to deal with the, condes the condescending tones, the disrespect, the sexual harassment, just to follow or pursue your passion, and it's not fair. I knew what I needed to do, but Guys, my hands were literally shaking as I sent those tweets out because I'm like, does this mean that this is over for me in sports? Is he going to blackball me? And I don't you mean know. to cut you off too. What you also have to think about is you're a black female going up against a black man. And so how is this going to be received? Because there aren't that many black guys in this position that got to where he's at. So now you're trying to take out one of our own when he, sh when what he did it was not wrong. right whatever yeah well, but you whatever have to weigh that stuff those are you situations do. that are real and then you feel like you can't speak up back when it when it happened and lots of times what you see with with and i was tweeting about this yesterday when victims are oppressed then it's like okay you can either speak up knowing that you may not get another job again um exactly. so then you have to weigh that option or you weigh the option okay well i can i can leave i can walk away with like my with peace with my peace and not have and know it like it, it eats at you because you want to share have, some of your experiences but you, you also have the erasure of black women so one of the things that one of the people on that thread was saying yesterday was besides from putting up with the sexual harassment and having to go through all of that which was wrong 
They he took my name took off your, of my article. Took your intellectual property, like eight hundred articles, 800 and just made it seem like that. Just yeah. that's what we call erasure, and just erase it like you weren't there. Yeah, yeah no, he, he, he did that. It was um two and a half years of work, eight hundred plus articles, and boom, I'm no longer like getting credit for it. My name is nowhere on the the article. And like Tiffany said, when you have those, you know, speak out and maybe not get a job or walk away with your piece. I walked away with what I thought was my piece. But it's not, yeah, you it's know. never good enough. Yeah. Right. I walked away with my piece, but because I walked away on my own terms, I had to deal with the sabotage behind the scenes. I had to deal with the lies and the different text messages sent to people or, hey, you know, by the way, Sheena never shows up. So you did little, he did little systematic things to sabotage and i'm like jesus i've been away for two years i'm not speaking publicly about what has happened or what you did and that's still not enough you're still you know behind the scenes trying to sabotage even after you know you guys saw the apology or lack thereof um you know he reached out personally because his lawyer told him to but at the same time that i'm looking at this email where you're like call me so i can apologize and you know you got me blocked on the other hand, I'm getting tipped off that you have created false, like, criminal records for me. So it's just like, at what point, you know, is enough enough? You know, I had a, we had a former writer that actually was a former friend of mine. She is, she wasn't black, but she's a woman of color. And she actually got on there and, and basically was like, oh, you know, this could ruin a black man. And I'm like, so you want to uphold this black man at the expense of all the black women, not only the, um, the black women that worked for him, but the black women that were turned away completely from the sports world because of him or young women that have didn't even try after they left BSO because they felt like they had no chance. And to me, he's a small sacrifice for all the women that, you know, had to turn their back on their passion or had to, you know, go work a job that they completely hate because of their experience with him. So like you said, it's the biggest it, thing it, to say. In, I guess the biggest thing to say, and maybe she is in the situation she was in, but if anybody's listening to it, I didn't call the name, but somebody said the name said something like BSO. If you follow it, anybody listening to it, if you follow it, if you retweet it, if you read it, then you are also contributing to the problem. So X men, the heck out of this dude. He should have no more following. His paper should be treated like toilet paper. Do not follow it. If you do, then you're helping perpetuate it. Don't follow this dude no more. Okay. Uh, I want to bring it back around, too, because um, that kind of correlates with, oh, well, it's not happening to me, so it doesn't affect me. And so that's when people turn a blind eye to things like, well, I still want to follow this, this group of people. I still want to follow. I mean, Barstool had stuff come out today. People, right. you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different stuff that you may find funny, but it's like, why are you associating with that when something is flat out racist? Wow. Um, yeah. The other thing too, because I know we want to stay on topic, um, but uh, the, the, what Sheena said about people asking her about sleeping, sleeping with people to get stories and all that kind of stuff, I personally never encounter that, right? But I'm going to say that that is a woman problem across sports because I've heard nasty things said to me about white female coworkers, other women of color, female sport, uh, coworkers, like that's across the board that, um, and that's something that we all have to bridge the gap together on. But I do want to make it so we can, like we're telling you our experiences, but I want you to be able to walk away with taking something too, where, especially if you're in a position to hire people or, or things like that. Like when we talk about creating space for black women in sports, um, it's sometimes it starts at the top, right? So if you've got like an old, old, like white guy in charge, right? Who's only been hiring a certain type of people or he's only being brought a certain type of people because the circle's full of nothing but, you know, white people. Um, right. That's what happens. That's how other people's people get boxed out. So it's not about giving a handout. Everyone likes to say it's, it's, it's a hand up. Yeah. So it's basically opening your eyes to seeing yeah. that, oh, I, you know what? I never thought about hiring Sheena for something because I only know this circle of people that all look like me. Um, so that's what it's about. It's not like taking jobs, or just handing out jobs to black people to, to meet a quota. It's, you need to like, a, like wholeheartedly just put in the effort to get outside of your box and your circle. Like I've been outside of my box. I've gone to a bar at UGA going to visit friends and I'm the only white person in, or black person, excuse me, in Boar's Head. Like <laughs> I've been outside of my box all the time. I think other people need to step outside of theirs 
and open up to see you know who else is out there for for opportunities um i think someone else wanted to jump in but i want to keep us moving too so i can get to kb's question sorry kb no um i just want to, to to jump in and say this um we always have to hold each other accountable um you know when you get a platform like in in, in sheena's situation um if you're a black man then you know that doesn't give you license to be misogynist and so as a fellow black man, then we have to make sure that we do what's necessary to protect not only our black women, but any woman um, who is faced with that situation. But you know, not just black men, but you no know, white men. One of the, um, my, my backstory is that motivated me to even want to get into this space was a few years ago when Jamel Hill and Michael Smith, you know, had their spot on ESPN. You know, being able to look at them every day and see their faces in prime time, you know, let me know that we could actually do this. But it took like next to no time for you know Jamel to find herself in a controversy because she was trying to speak a truth, and um, and I still feel some type of way about that. And because of that, I wanted to you know dream and write. You know, I was like, if I could actually grow, you know, a sports media thing, I want I would want to create that safe space that you're talking about. But let's say if I was able to do that. Each step I would take along the way and for every person I would want to give opportunity to, you know, I can't let that power get to my head. And I would want somebody to hold me accountable and make sure that I was, you know, practicing good hiring practices and, you know, using good hiring practices, bringing in people, taking care of people, leading people the right way. And, um, and so I just say this, you know, when we see people, you know, we, we, you know, we focus on racism, um, but there are also other things going on out there that hurt people, bigotry, misogyny. And, um, and when we see it, we know we just have to, to call it out, you know, so we can keep people accountable and keep people treating other people right. And so, you know, that's all I had to say about that, and, you know, so we can keep moving on. No, thank you. Clarence Thomas, oh. jump in one second real quick. Yeah. Um, I just kind of want to just give y'all 30 seconds. A lot of people want to know why people never come out and say things. Sheena and Tiffany just explained to you exactly why Black women, or women, period, keep quiet on things. Yeah. But especially Black yeah. women. The opportunities are very limited and you got to stop saying well if it's true how come they didn't come out when it happened this is why they're telling you exactly why right. please understand when you see frustration coming from the african-american community when you start speaking about diversity and hiring as jobs like y'all don't know what tiffany and sheena go through right are these pants too tight because my hips are big are these earrings too big is my hair too urban so they can spend so much time preparing for an interview on what they should wear what they should look like when you might get Susie or Karen, I hate to use that, but it is what it is, who so walk into an opportunity and they can come in looking however they want. But because it's a comfort level between the person who's interviewing them and they're working with, they don't have to think twice or three or four times before they put on what they want to put on. So when you see a black woman upset or you see her frustrated, please understand that is not how she is on a regular basis. You don't know what she went through. You don't know what she had to go through just to get that interview, just to get that job. Cause I can honestly tell you um, as a leader on different jobs, I have seen black women come in and they're already tired when they walk in because they've spent so much time figuring out, you know, if her name's Lushina, do I have to shorten it to make it seem more appealing and, and, and wanting, right? Like me, my name is Bobby, but you'll see Bob everywhere because of the the, uh, the company I work for. Literally, I've been looked past for Bobby, but with Bob, I've gotten so many opportunities just because just of a name change. So it's the small things like that. It's, it's, it's the hair, it's the earrings, it's the clothing, it's the names. We come from a different culture and we can't be accepted because of that. So we spend so much time mentally killing ourselves trying to figure out how can we how we can be acceptable to a society that doesn't want to accept us. So when you see this frustration on this panel right now, understand we're not just speaking out of ignorance, we're speaking out of experience. And speaking Tiffany from experience, and yeah. are really trying to break this thing down to you. And I really hope y'all are listening to Tiffany and Sheena because the things that they're going through is I really wish they could write a book together and get others to write a book with them. Because what there's going so through. many thank you for saying it because there's so many experiences with um, women across the board in sports that we could all probably write a book about it. Um, but back to the victim thing too, like when, when something happens and you don't speak up about it because you're, you're fearing for your job, you're fearing because you want to stay in the industry that you're in. So you hold, you hold it in. Right. And then somehow you think, okay, it's, it was just me. It was just me. And then maybe later, like Sheena and the rest of those young, um, young women found out too. It wasn't just, it wasn't just that. It was other people. Um, I've gone through stuff like that. And so it's like you you wait and then you see it still happening. And then you're like, 
well, I didn't do anything to stop it back then. And so then you're also hit with another batch of like guilt and it weighs on you. And then you speak up and in hopes that something will happen. And a lot of cases for some people, nothing happens, right? Um, I'm so, I'm glad that what's happening is happening now. I hope that it keeps going on. There's a lot of victims that have been silenced too. You have to keep that in mind. There's, there's people out there that can't talk because they legally cannot talk. And that's so unfortunate because they've had to make a choice to stay silent in order to keep their livelihood. Um, that was another sidebar. So excuse me for that. And then the hair stuff. I mean, I rocked my braids last year. Oh, let me tell you how much I deliberated over that and how much I went back and forth, like sending pictures. Can I do this? Okay. My hair is not naturally straight. All right. I got thick, and I, I don't want to cuss on here, but I got thick hair. <laughs> it's in a bun now because I didn't feel like doing it today because it takes me like two and a half hours to blow dry through this stuff and straighten it. And so it's like, okay, well, I'm covering training camp and I'm in the hottest region in the country and I'm sweating it out. Like my hair is going to curl up and get big. I'm sure a lot of you have seen all my live shots where my hair has been <laughs> huge. My sister will text me and tell me. But, um, but anyway, braids were a way for me to protect my hair from forcing it to be straight, which is something it's not. Um, and so I should have had to like, to think about that. Or Deshaun, that's here in Charlotte. Um, she wears her natural hair. And gosh, we had a lot of, we had so many good conversations about that when I was talking to her, um, about her getting nasty emails from people because her hair is a distraction or things like that. Yeah. No, this is how my, like my hair grows. Um, don't mean to go on that. I could talk about that for a minute. Yeah, Tiff, Tiff, even though like well-meaning people sometimes do things, so I know I wear the fro. I ain't picked it today, but the fro there. <laughs> so you get to the tailgate and we're having a good time, and then somebody inevitably says, "Can I touch your hair?" And See? you know they're not meaning no. You know they're not meaning any harm. But if I can tell you every tailgate, how many people stop to say, can I touch your hair, is really? sort of offensive. I mean, wow. can't, don't can't find people it. Well, understand that. Well, so, Sheena, his that hair is a thing to behold. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me to KB's question. I'm, I'm sorry, we, we had a lot to talk about there, KB, mm -hmm. but about the inclusive atmosphere. So um, he asked, assuming it's a he, excuse me. Um, do you consider the fan experience at Bank of America Stadium to be inclusive and unified in our collective love of the Panthers, or have you experienced racism in ways that white fans like myself might not be aware of on ooh, game days? Now, ooh. I'm not out there in the parking lot, so I can't, spe I can't speak to Boy, that. I'm inside ooh, the stadium. Can I go? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I have an experience. Actually, two experiences. Um, but I'll go with the most recent one. I was at the, the, the Falcons versus Panthers game whenever that occurred this past season. I can't remember the month and day, maybe November. Um, so, you know, we understand the, the Panthers are getting demolished, first of all. And at halftime, I decided to, you know, go take a bathroom break. I go in there with my son, who is 11. And, um, and so we're in, the, we're in the restroom and you know, the line is taking forever. There's a, a white guy, bald head, muscle bound dude, and he's waiting in the line next to me. So we meet this guy who's standing just in front of me and he recognizes my Panthers culture shirt. So he asked me a question about it. You know, we started engaging. Um, the question came up about, you know, what, we, you know, what do you think is gonna happen with Cam? So me and him started going back and forth, hey, you know, I don't know, man, we hope that he gets healthy. You know, being very optimistic about Cam's future um, in Carolina, this guy, the white guy next to us, just interrupted our conversation very loudly and rudely. Cam Newton, he's done, he's done, he's quit on us. And I was like, hold on, bro. You know, like we in our own conversation in our own zone right here. You need to stop talking about Cam Newton. He quit on us. We're done with him. He's sorry. And I'm like, but bro, why do you think you have the license to just end our private conversation to, to, to berate Cam Newton? And, you know, and, and he walked over to us, which was the problem for me because I don't know if you've been drinking, but I'm fully coherent and I'm not a small dude. So I like this <laughs> bathroom floor with you. And that's what my thought was, but I had my son there. 
And so he goes to curse and he was like, just watch you see, there's going to be Matt Stafford here next year. There's going to be, um, who else did he mention? He said, Matt Stafford is going to get traded here, Phillip Rivers, you know, anybody but anybody black, you know, and anybody but Cam would do. And to me, you know, I, I have my son there who is a huge Cam Newton fan. And here's this guy who came and interrupted our conversation, you know, now, you know, just, I don't know, making the, making the whole situation uncomfortable because I right. feel like I have to get loud. And we walk up to the stalls together. He's still talking to me as I'm relieving myself because he's just at that point in line. I'm like, look, man, I just, I can't deal with you right now. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And I go back to my seat, he go back to his, and on the way out, he's still yapping, yapping, yapping. And I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, like, what has Cam did to you for you to jump into a conversation about his health and his, you know, future prospects for, you know, just for you to go ballistic like that? Right. And um, honestly, I just felt like it wasn't a good experience. You know, you pay a lot of money to get into these games, you know, especially get into some good 100 level seats and to go to the restroom, have that type of experience and feel like, you know, you in a situation around other fans, you know, that don't look like you at any time anything is mentioned that's pro cam or pro something they don't like, you feel like you might have to fight your way up out of there. And yeah. I don't know if everybody's experienced that, but I yeah. have, I have twice. I have, you know, back in you know, this past game and back in 2014, um, San Francisco versus Carolina in the playoffs. Same thing, guys behind me getting drunk, threatening to throw beers at me and craziness. You know, it can happen. And it happened to me twice in Carolina. I go to Carolina, you know, because, you know, that's the team. But I haven't been in there and felt really comfortable in the stadium one time. Well, I take that back. My last experience there, I was able to sit with sit with Zach. And that was a pleasant experience, but it was kind of a controlled environment. I mean, Even I was, when we go places, like when we went to London, there was just this hanging in the air because – People wanted to talk about Cam when we were there to just have fun. And, you know, I wish Cam was playing. But he got touch and go some nights at the bar right before we got on from a certain group of fans that wanted to be so, you know, just say whatever they felt about Cam. And it always went back to, like, typical black stereotypes that yes. for a while it made the trip to London not fun until my wife and I just removed ourselves from it. So that right. was the biggest time that it rang its face with And do you want to get specific to, I mean, to highlight? Like, well, to people, so like, it was like after folks was drinking and then it would be like, well, you see Cam in playing because you know he nursing that injury and he cares more about wearing his women clothes than he does about playing. And then, you know, we got on the bus to go on one of our excursions and actually, like, I think Lauren was on the bus with us from the riot. And, you know, she could tell Keisha and I wasn't happy. So she spoke up. It was like, you know, y'all need to go on with this cam stuff. We're out here to have fun. It only happens, it rears its head more when people are drinking. And like Bobby is saying, you catch them in the bathroom, or maybe they throw stuff down and get mad at a game, or they get drunk. And man, the cam is a thug. Cam is a. And it's all these black stereotypes will then surface. And like even without a Panther experience, one time I was with somebody just to get throw this in, had thought him and I, he and I were really cool, and we were drinking. And my wife and I were dating at the time, and he, and he said, "You know what? I tell everybody about you, Robert. You're the funniest." And then he stopped because he caught himself. <laughs> You, you, you wow. know what I mean? After that, we weren't friends and we didn't hang anymore. But the alcohol brings out stuff that people normally might not say. And, and just to jump in real fast, I'm sorry, just, I, just two seconds. So what, so Rob said some things that were more like direct racism, um, mm -hmm. but then there's also stuff that there's the undertone of it. So that's what um, is important for you all to know that like as a black person, um, you can – 
pick up on the on the undertone and i'm not like maybe mm -hmm. i'm not you know you're going to jump in you can speak more to that but you know what they're trying to say or you know what they meant, meant um, but they yeah. did it in a way that they they didn't directly say it kind of like oh you're not black black or oh you you speak so um you know, i can't even speak <laughs> you speak so proper yes yes it's, well, you know, you know, it's funny i was sitting there thinking that um earlier today i said you know what you rarely meet a well-spoken white person Nobody ever identifies it because everybody expects that they speak the truth. Well, that's true, perfectly. yeah. So, you know, if you articulate black person or well spoken black person, it's always highlighted. Oh, you, you speak, you're so well spoken. So well spoken, yes. yeah. And articulate, that's the word I was asking. You're so articulate, <laughs> but you never meet an articulate or such a well spoken white person. They white just, person, yeah. If they speak well, then it's, it's expected for them to speak well. So that's what we mean when we say like the undertone of stuff. So yeah. really think about the words that you're using. Bobby, um, Bobby, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you, you're good, you're good. So um, I think in 2011, um, I believe some things are bigger than sports. Some things are about revelation. And no one can deny the moment Cam Newton walked in that locker room, things changed with the Charlotte media. Um, we all on this panel, as well as those who are watching know that as a black person, I can look at JJ and be like, bro, you pick up on that? He'd be like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. And Tiffany can be like, did she just? And I can be like, yep. Like, because we know the term thug. Mm -hmm. Like, we understand what it's a replacement for. And right. for me, if, you know, I'm just gonna be honest, it's a replacement for the word nigga. That's what it is. And they use, um, they use that term to, you know, to be degrading, right, towards an athlete. They're not using these terms for Ben Roethlisberger when he has a rape case. They're not using these words for Tom Brady when he gets caught cheating again. They're not using these words for I uh, forgot what the what the Giants kicker's name was that that was oh, yeah. uh, you know having domestic violence issues with his wife. Mm -hmm. They're using them for guys like Josh Gordon. They're using them for guys like Cam Newton. They're using them for guys like Antonio Brown. And the usage is so common to one color. So we pick up on the undertones, we pick up on the, because you can't diagnose and break down something that he messed up on, you're gonna look at what he's wearing because that's the next way you can break him down as a man, right? And that's just not Cam, that's everyone. It goes down the list of an African-American athlete. When you take a look at the fact that they can't call him what they want to call him, they're now gonna jump into their personal life and you start to look at guys like DeAndre Hopkins with the O'Brien situation, you, you're making comments about, you know, your baby mama, you know, being here, you would have never used the term baby mama to a white guy who had his child's mother or fiance, your girlfriend, a spouse, a wife, whatever you want to call it, there. You wouldn't have used baby mama. So we pick up on these terms that you all are using. Please understand that we may not look like you, but we're not foolish. We may not have the same education as you, but we are self-educated. We understand what you are trying to do. We understand the language you're using, the lingo that you use when you smirk to your friends. We see it. We see the eye contact that you make towards one another. When we walk in the grocery store with the hoodie on, we're not dumb. We're just smart enough to ignore it because we know if we don't ignore it, it's going to escalate to a different level that we don't have the preparation for. So it's the same thing that these athletes are dealing with. They are holding the media to, to just enough. They'll, they'll give you the frustration, but they're not going to cross that line because they understand the next thing that happens is gonna be a blackballing or a headlines everywhere across the country. Um, we pick up on what you're saying. We know what you're saying. We're not ignorant because we don't respond to it. We're just more aware. We share it with one another and we recognize it in the community. Yeah. Um, a word that somebody shared with me in my professional career, and I share this story all the time is, um, as black people, black professionals, you have to use discernment in everything that you do. You have to be able to case the room um, because specifically when I was being taught this from a fellow black professional woman, um, again, black women, um, she said, Jesse, I have brothers in professional, you know, in professional life, in life or whatever. And you're one of, you know, you're one of my brothers because you're a black man. She said, always have discernment. Um, know how much you need to give, know how much you need to hold back. Um, you know, if you're too, if you're too excitable, if you're too passionate, you know, you could be perceived as an angry black man. Um, if you're too passive, then you'll be perceived as a lazy black man. Um, you got to walk this, this tightrope, you know, of being just in the middle 100% of the time, 
um, just to be successful. And what Bobby's saying is for professional athletes, it's like that. These men are rich. You know, they can buy whatever designer clothes they want. They can drive whatever they want. You know, and a lot of them, because their life has been so regimented and controlled to become a great athlete, that one of the ways that they can express themselves is through fashion, some outlet that allows them to be creative and show the world that they are an individual, right? Especially NFL players, um, because the whole game is in the uniform. Um, yeah. Versus a basketball player, you know, we see their faces, we know who they are. Football players, they wear a helmet every time they're on the field. So when they get off the field, they, they want to showcase, this is my individuality. That's who Cam Newton was. It's just that mainstream, you know, America can't process that he could be that fashionable and also be a great player. You know, it's like he's trying to be too free. He's making us uncomfortable, you know, and, and some of this is, you know, it's not only just racism, it's toxic masculinity. You know, men have an expectation for how other men have to act in order to be considered masculine. Um, that's a problem. So it's so many different things that we face, um, you know, as black men, as black women, you know, we have to just stay just so, we have to walk that tightrope um, so we won't be perceived, you know, too extreme in any, in any direction. And so uh, it's just a challenge, man. And, and all we can do is just support each other um, and do what we're doing today, you know, try to educate folks on what we go through so they can know how to receive us, not accept us, I wanna, receive us. And I want us to be able, um, since we've, we've blown past that hour, um, I'll give us maybe five more minutes, um, unless <laughs> Josh wants to text me. Um, but maybe we can just touch on the last topic too, just so um, we can wrap it out, but I'll skip over the next few. Um, maybe we can squeeze this in. Okay, what's a, someone can take this, but how can we make sports in general, how can we maybe start it in the stadium just to make this more of an inclusive atmosphere for everybody? Something else besides can't scratch fever. <laughs> Josh says there's no rush, so okay. <laughs> never mind. But we can fit in these last two, though. But <laughs> you, Josh. So what's, what's the question again, Tiffany? Um, just how can we make it more, like how can we use sports, which we're already seeing it now, but if, if there's anyone wants to weigh in on any more things about how we can create maybe a more inclusive atmosphere um, at these games, um, when you guys are in the stands or at tailgates, um, are there any, I guess, ways that you all feel that the atmosphere, I've never, I've actually never, I don't know if I've ever even been to a tailgate before. Um, That's like one I've always been on the other side, so and, you you know, know, there's that, a way to make it, you know, make everyone feel welcome. People of all colors. Well, I think it's kind of difficult, right? You know, when I look at the way games are set up and ticket costs, you know, you have, you know, certain seats, you know, that cost certain prices, and you know, and, and so the only place, you know, like certain people are sitting in the, on the lower bowl and you know, and then the cheaper seats are up top, and 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 a lot of times, you know, and I hate to put it like this, but you don't see as much diversity in the lower bowl as you do up top. You know, the places where you see people to come together at is in the concession area. Um, that's in the game. That's inside the stadium. Um, outside the stadium, um, a plug for the Roaring Riot. You know, the Roaring Riot tailgate is very diverse. Um, I think for the fan base, you know, one thing that we can do is do what Bobby did. Uh, I think it was last week, you know, where he offered free memberships, you know, to people, you know, so they can get that experience. I thought that was beautiful um, because, you know, it, it allows you to come in at a very low cost and be able to come into um, a Panthers game just through the tailgate experience. Even if you didn't have, you know, even if you can't afford to go into the game, you can experience the fellowship outside the stadium and then make it home in time enough to, to catch the game on television or something or go to the bar. Um, that's one way. What the Roaring Ride does is one way. I'm sure there are other fan groups that can that you know can do that. I think you have to seek out opportunities to to increase the diversity. Um, you know, outside of the stadium. You know, again, what the Roaring Ride is doing, but beyond football and beyond sports. Um, I read James Baldwin. Um, I think it was the Fire Next Time, where he mentioned one of the biggest problems we have in our society. I mean, American society is that as Black folks. Um, we have to wake up every day and enter into a white person's world, a predominantly white person's world. We have to make that adjustment. We have to acclimate every single day of our lives just to be successful um, for the most part. And if we're not, it's because we are in a very urban area 
and we might be entrepreneurs or somehow making it work within our area. But for the most part, that's what we have to do. Most white people don't have to cross those tracks into our neighborhoods. They don't have to open themselves up to what we experience every day. They don't have to come and fellowship in our neighborhoods and find out what it's like to be black. Um, they don't have to come and code switch, you know, to be black. And if they do, then it's probably going to be offensive and it's going to turn into a problem. Um, <laughs> if you code switch explain, well. explain code switch if someone <laughs> out there doesn't understand. So, so code switching, um, code switching is something that most black professionals have to do. Um, if, they're in the, if they're not working in entertainment or something, you know, in, in white collar society, we have to talk a certain way. You know, we have I, to, I, the youth, yes, yeah. And we have to come off with a certain dialect, you know, that's very inoffensive and very palatable. But if you already talk people. like that, you get made fun of. Yeah, when you're from North, <laughs> when you're from North Gwinnett, you know, I'm from Gwinnett <laughs> County, so I live in Gwinnett County. So when you go to North Gwinnett, you already talk like that. Uh, <laughs> but, but country guys from South Carolina, like me and Rob, we don't come with that natural vernacular. Rob is very good when he wants to do it. He's a good coach, which I'm good at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, a, he's, he's, he's flawless. But it's a challenge, you know, to code switch. And every single day, you have to realize where you are at all times and who you're talking to. And 99% of the time, if you're a black professional, white collar world, you have to code switch in order to survive and thrive. Um, a white person don't even know what that is, you know, for the most part. They don't have to code switch to, to, to be with the black people. Um, they don't do anything that we do or know what it is to be black on a daily basis. They don't have dinner with us. They don't come into our houses and vice versa. You know, we don't do it with those either, but we don't feel we have the access or the permission to. Um, you know, what our society needs to do more of is seeking ways to come together. Um, I would like to see our white brethren um, try to find ways to come to our neighborhoods to find out how we live, find out what it's like to be black. You know, hang out with us. You know, go to the store with us. Go to our, you know, whatever we have. Come and eat with us. Go to our to our soul food restaurants. You know, see how we interact. See what's normal for us. And um, I think if they can do that, and you know, and so a part of this conversation that we haven't really tapped into is law enforcement. You know, if law enforcement could do more of that, if they could, you know, if they find out what area they're policing, if the first thing, you know, a, a young whatever their rank is, you know, if, if they find out that they're going to be policing a certain, you know, a certain area that's predominantly black, first thing they need to do, you know, the first thing they need to do is go walk those streets, go find out who hangs out at the corner store, what's their names, you know, what they do, and, um, and establish some type of- Shoot somebody that you know, yeah, you have a relationship that. with. So when you called out to find out, you know, who's selling CDs, you know, at the corner store in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, hey, look, that's my guy out that's my guy Alton. That I know him, you know, so he ain't a problem. Let me go talk to him and find out what's going on. But instead, he's a stranger. And like what Bobby said early on, I, I have the same problem. I'm six foot, 250 pounds. As soon as I stand up, broad shoulder, big chested, I'm a problem. And so everything elevates. And so the force that they might take because of that is going to be more than the force they would take on somebody they would perceive as being smaller and weaker. And, um, and so I, our blackness is a weapon. I'll give you this stat. And I won't, I mean, I, I have a, I work in a very credible place in this, and I won't go too far into that. But you've seen this in other places. Black men are 2.9% times more likely to be killed at the hands of law enforcement um, than our white counterparts. But this is the kicker. Of all the demographics of men, and I'm gonna include women in this because, like Bobby said, women need to be included in the stat. Um, our demographic is the least likely to be carrying a weapon. So, how can we be the least likely to be carrying a weapon, but suffer three times the amount of deaths at the hands of law enforcement when there's no statistical data that supports the reason they take lethal force against us? Right. It's our blackness. And, um, and so, it's so many things, so many layers to you know to this issue. But again, going back to how we got here, a lot of that can be alleviated if they were able to come into our neighborhoods and find out who is who and who does what and how we live and how we communicate. Their interactions with us would be totally different, not only for law enforcement but just day to day. Well, I think thank you. I oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Too. No, no, no. We have a question, but I want to make sure we got to it. But go, you go ahead. 
For sure, just really quick. I think with that question that you asked about what they can do at, you know, in the stadium at the tailgates in reference to, for one, we got to get more black people in the stadiums, in the arenas, and at the events. <laughs> Coming up, for most black people I know, they got used to hearing that costs too much, right? That's like, right. nah, we good. You know, you will watch other people take those vacations to Disney World or get to go to the state fair, get to go to those basketball and football games. But we got to grow up with our, you know, we grew up with our parents and grandparents telling us that something costs too much. And they may have even had the money to do it, but it was that it cost too much, right? They didn't see a purpose behind it. Um, white people see this as a bonding opportunity, you know, as a lifetime experience. And the black community just doesn't see it that way. And um, I think if there was some way um, for it to be pitched that way, to be sold that way, in some way, shape, or form, I can't wrap my mind around how, but if we start selling these things as experiences and opportunities to bond with your family, bond with your children, I mean, my son and I bonded over a freaking athlete in Cam Newton. You know, when my, my son wanted to be a Redskins fan, right? And Cam came along and it changed his mind. My son is like, he literally helped raise me and he's my son, right? I have him every single day. But it's not a day that goes by that we don't discuss Cam Newton, right? And this is something as simple as an athlete, right? We're talking about just an athlete, right? And we have a conversation, even when the room is quiet and we're watching a movie, as soon as the movie go off, it could just be a random question about Cam. Did he sign yet? Like, what did they say about his health? Whatever the case may be. And this is something that we've spent countless hours talking about. So I will beg the black community, like, we can't just keep looking for another community to help us. We have to see the importance and the opportunities and things as well to allow opportunities to come to us, right? Because if we're not there, then there's not much that a guy like Dave Tepper or Roger Goodell or anyone like that can do if we're not there. And I think we need to understand that these are opportunities for our family. There's a bonding experience. I, I'm gonna stick with you, Bobby, because the question that came in, and then Sheena, like, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Um, want you to weigh in on it as well. Uh, this kept question came in from Jason. Um, he asked, do you feel, do you guys feel that the Patriots signing Cam Newton to a ridiculously low one-year deal was more of a PR marketing stunt because of the Black Lives Matter movement? Or do you think he was not signed for, excuse me, do you think he was not signed for so long because he was Black? I think he wasn't signed for so long because there's still question marks. And this offseason has pretty much been at a snail's pace because they can't travel. You know, the pandemic, I think the pandemic definitely adds to it. Um, I will say this, right when he was released, I was hearing, you know, my rumblings from his camp, which made sense that we could possibly not see Cam Newton signed until it's time for training camp. Because um, at the time it was told to me, like the strategy, basically people are lowballing him right now. But when you have a need, if someone, if your quarterback goes down and he's hurt, at that point, the player controls the, the, the negotiations more in, in that sense. But I definitely think that the pandemic played a part and I don't, I definitely don't think it's Black Lives Matter related. Now, if we were talking Colin Kaepernick, right, right. I would think it was more Black Lives Matter related. I wonder because it, it then makes me think about Jameis Winston and the deal that he took. And mm -hmm. to me, that was one of the most disrespectful deals I've ever seen in my life. A lot of people- Oh yeah, he got a horrible deal. deal. Yeah, and then I look at the Cam Newton potential, you know, with, with incentives. And it just makes me wonder, you know, you look at a guy like Chase Daniel and um, you see all of the money that he's racked up for being a career backup. You take a look at guys like, um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Brock Osweiler. You know, he, he racked up on this money. Oh, yeah. Um, you yeah know, Bradford. Yeah, right. And yeah, Bradford, too. And then you take a look at Cam and you say, OK, um, realistically, you know, as Panther fans, I think we need to be realistic, too. The guy was hurt, right? There was no proof that he was healthy other than workout videos. And we got to be honest. Well, he did. He did pass that physical. That's why, I mean, I don't think the signing is Black Lives Matter related or because he's black, but I think that the dollar amount, you know, we see black quarterbacks get, you know, crack deals all the time. So I think when it comes to the dollar amount, there is still, to me, a discrepancy between the black quarterbacks and white quarterbacks in the NFL. But the fact that he was signed isn't just because he's black. I mean, he's Cam Newton. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think this was just a plain, horrible deal. It does help Cam get to play and prove his worth. But the Patriots are always crooked and the Patriots are always sneaky. <laughs> an MVP quarterback. Tell us how you really a, feel, Rob. They, they, got a, they, got a, they got an MVP quarterback on a vet minimum deal mm -hmm. with incentives that sound like sharecropping. And at the same time that this is going on, nobody's paying attention that they just got busted. 
for cheating again, and they lost yeah. a third round pick. So they get Cam. Cam can leave Wins next well. year. And what do they, they get, get if Cam leaves right. next year? A third round pick. The Patriots won like crazy. Call it what you want. It's sharecropping. But I well, he's always playing that. chess. Yeah, I appreciate I mean, that. At the end of the I day, appreciate that Cam gets to play. Yeah, keep in mind. I mean, it's. I mean, at the end of the day, Cam still has to say yes to this deal, right? So, and we all know that rumors were. Uh, Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think they said it was the was it the Browns and the Patriots were the only teams interested in the Browns. Browns. Yeah, you know, which I think is a lie um, because we heard from other teams personally from GMs from other teams previously. But anyway, I think the whole thing around Cam is about a mixture. I think it's a mixture of teams were hesitant to take a chance on him due to the last year and a half of, of injuries. And I also think it had to do a lot with his personality, a black man that they cannot control. Cam Newton said it four days before the Super Bowl in 20, the 2015 season. He said, I know why you guys have a problem with me. I'm an African-American quarterback, and you do not know how to control. And he said that. And now we look at it, and we see it years later. It's the same thing. They don't know how to handle them. They don't know how to – they can't control them. So I think that does bring a hesitance on it. But, yes, I do think um, the signing is more about football than it is, you know, Black Lives Matter or anything like that. I agree. I can Horrible agree. deal, though. It is. We, we look, 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 y'all. We gonna always have a horrible deal. It's, it's I got, I, I'll I tell you me. what. If I'm Cam and they say I'm starting Snitham for first and, and second down, and you going out on third and four, I quit. I come back <laughs> next year. I ain't going out there and run around for third and four. I'll tell you that now. Right. Well, make sure somebody puts that on the agenda for the next meeting because we definitely have to talk about the discrepancies between the black quarterbacks and white quarterbacks in the NFL. Ooh. That's a yes. that's a that's a whole show's worth. Yeah, that that definitely is a topic. I think we covered a lot of ground today um, or tonight, I should say. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Another couple more topics, but um, I think we're safe to wrap it up. If you sure. guys are. If we're gonna maybe we'll do another one of these because there's a lot. It's a lot I mean, more that we probably so could unpack. But um, but again, open to oh, questions. Tiffany, Tiffany, um, before you go, that's another yeah. thing that black people have a hard time with because you know I'm on the political side and not the corporate side. You know, I walk in the rooms and people say stuff like that, and I'm confused as heck. So Robert, let's unpack it. I'd be like, what? My bank pack? What are y'all <laughs> talking about? Just say what you want. You want to talk about it? Let's unpack it. <laughs> I, I uh, I'm open. I, I've been to therapy, so maybe that's why that uh, that always comes into my comes into play. Let's I hear it all the time. Let's unpack it. Let's unpack it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me from North Gwinnett. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> um, guys, again, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I mean, Bobby, JJ, Sheena, Rob. Um, this was some great insight from you guys. Um, we appreciate your questions as well. This will be posted on YouTube and want to remind you guys to, um, to donate, use that link that's on Facebook, that's on YouTube, because we are raising money for 22 and 54 together with Christian McCaffrey and Shaq Thompson uniting, um, uniting together to use sports as a way to bring the community together. So, um, guys appreciate your time. Appreciate you all watching and, um, and thank you.